Hey, it's Jen here for Tested to share some tips with you today about picture framing. So for a long time in a past life, when I was much younger, I worked in several different picture framing shops. Now, if you ever had artwork professionally framed, you know that it can be pretty expensive and it seems like a pretty specialized process. Um, it is it is something that takes a lot of kind of uh, fine-tuned tools and knowledge of how to actually put the pieces together, but it's not that inaccessible. Uh, when I worked at the frame shop, I was able to take home tons and tons of scrap pieces of molding, so just off-cut pieces that were left over from larger frames, and I took a ton of it home with me, so I have piles and piles of this stuff. It's worth quite a bit of money, and uh, I wanted to make some frames out of it. So over the past year, I finally decided to invest in some prosumer level tools to make something out of all this frame molding that I've got. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can get into this. So I've got all this fancy molding. Um, these are typically like pre-finished wood, sometimes they're resin. Um, a lot of times you'll get really nice decorative frame profiles and these vary in price, um, but you can also do this in much simpler ways. So I also went to the hardware store and just got some simple one by twos. Um, this is some red oak. Uh, I've also got just totally plain pine. And what I did with this was just to uh, route out a channel, um, basically using the table saw to cut a channel for the artwork. Um, so you can do this relatively inexpensively if you don't have access to frame molding. So just to give you a few examples of some pieces that I've made for myself, uh, this is a print, uh, this is actually a, a Haeckel print uh, book plate that I picked up on Etsy. And then I cut the mats myself, uh, cut the frame pieces and assembled this whole package um, at home with the scrap pieces that I have. Uh, I've also done some simpler stuff, just some kind of nature prints. I really like this one of the beetles. Not those beetles, these beetles. And here's an example of one that I made just out of the one by twos. This is a rather large poster of the Bay Area. I'm not sure if you can even see the bottom of that. There we go. So this is just made from one by twos that I stained with a cherry stain and uh, then wired up the back to hang on the wall. The first step of pretty much the entire process is to look at your artwork and measure exactly how big you want your frame to be. So I'll usually start off with my print uh, and then I take a little bit off the edges. So you don't wanna have the, um, the mat coming right out to the outside. You want it to overlap just a little bit. So I'll usually leave like a quarter inch margin, uh, measure that in from the outside dimensions of the artwork. And then I figure out exactly how much mat margin I want. That's the space between the edge of the artwork and the outside of the frame. And I use all of these uh, dimensions to figure out exactly how big the frame itself should be. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, you do need to take into account the actual width of the frame itself. So when you're um, measuring the frame, this particular kind has what's called a rabbit on the back. Uh, this is basically the, the overlap where this is going to go over the top of the, the glass and your entire frame package. If you were going to, say, route out a channel, um, you would then measure the, the thickness from the inside of that channel to the outside of the frame. And the reason we do that is when you, when you figure out the size of your frame window, you want to make sure to account for the thickness of the material. Um, so I will go through and take all of my measurements and then figure out the width of my long and short legs of each frame. I have cut these all on the miter saw. Uh, I use a nice sharp 90 tooth finish blade um, and make sure that that angle is a perfect 45. I like to use a digital angle finder uh, to check that. And then I just go ahead and cut all of my mitered corners. You can see these are, these are nice and smooth. The edges are, they look really nice. There's no tear out. And this is ready to start assembling. So I like to dry fit uh, the whole frame first, make sure all my corners look good before I start actually attaching anything. And in a frame shop, typically, uh, you would have a pretty perfect 45. There's not, not a lot of margin for error. I am using a, you know, kind of hobbyist miter saw with not a perfect blade. Um, so I'm gonna get a little bit of blade deflection. My corners are not gonna be perfect, but that looks good enough to me. So I'm gonna now uh, apply some glue as a precursor to putting in the actual hardware. 
Uh, in the frame shop, you would usually use uh, some type of a wood or framing glue um, that will seep into the fibers of the wood and create a pretty strong hold. Uh, there are specialized clamps that are used for holding these miters. They're really expensive. They have kind of padded jaws so you can hold everything in there and it holds your entire frame so that everything's at a perfect 45. I have yet to invest in those clamps, so there's a couple ways you can go. Uh, there are smaller corner clamps. These are just meant for basic woodworking, um, and these will work for positioning on your frame corners. For a frame this size, I actually like to just do this by hand. So I will, um, I will kind of glue and position these uh, without using any clamps and kind of just eyeball it and hopefully get everything as, as square as possible. So in the frame shop, we would just use wood glue. For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna speed things up a little bit and add a little bit of super glue just so that um, it can grab a little faster. So I'll glue uh, opposite corners first. So I'm gonna do one, one group of legs and another group of legs over here. And if you are using a frame that has any type of finish on it, you wanna um, take a minute here to actually add a little bit of um, kind of clean up on the corner. So this one is white and you can see the, the edge here is nice and clean, but on a picture frame that has some uh, finish on it, like this is a cherry type of finish, there's not really anything on the edge. The, the wood grain goes right up to the edge here. So there's a little trick. When I'm joining a frame like this, I will use uh, wood markers. These are just uh, furniture finishing markers and mark the edges of my miters. And this will prevent any of uh, the wood from showing. If your join isn't perfect, you won't be able to see that highlight of the wood in there. So I just mark the very edges on all four of my corners. Once my corners are joined and glued, um, I can then bring them over to this next device, which is uh, used for adding hardware to the back of the frames. Now, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, professional sort of carpenters uh, will make really nice frames out of wood and cut the rabbit with router, and you can use splines to join the corners. You can also just use uh, finishing nails. So if you've got some unfinished wood, you can glue these corners up and shoot some finishing nails. They're virtually invisible um, and they're pretty stable. I will sometimes reinforce them with additional hardware on the back. For a finish molding like this, I don't want the hardware to be visible. I want the, the uh, fastener to go completely unnoticed behind the frame. So the easiest way to do that is with something called a V nail. Uh, and it's basically a tiny little nail that's shaped like a V and it's got some dimension to it and it goes into the back almost like a staple through your miter joint and it holds everything together because the glue by itself is not gonna hold that frame for forever. Um, there's a couple different kinds of V-nails. You have different thicknesses um, and different dimensions. There's also um, soft and hard V-nails for different types of wood. Uh, and you can join a couple of V-nails into the back of the frame. So depending on the width of your molding, you can do a stack up of a few V-nails at once. In a frame shop, they use a tool called an underpinner. Uh, it's a huge pneumatic machine and you put your join corners in and usually step on a foot pedal and it shoots this V-nail into the underneath side of the frame super quickly, uh, very powerful and also very expensive. Um, so instead of investing in a multiple thousand dollar machine and a whole air compression system, I have this little manual tool that does the job just fine. Uh, this is called a Pro Joiner. Uh, this is made by a framing company called Logan. Um, and this is the model F300-2. Um, so what this does is I can put the frame uh, corners into the machine, load a V-nail, and then manually pull it on this lever and it will gently press that nail into the back of the molding. So no uh, air compression involved. It's all just uh, using leverage to get that to um, to fasten, but it works pretty well and uh, I found it to be fairly reliable. So once I have the, the pieces glued, I'm gonna carefully bring this over to the V-nailer. So I've positioned the uh, molding corner in the back of the V-nailer and I'm tightening this knob here just enough to grab the frame and hold it in that position. I also wanna set uh, the position of the sort of presser foot here. This has got a rubber um, plate on it, and I can adjust that using this lever here. And I want that presser foot to be positioned just about over the center of the molding. So in this case, it's pretty easy. If you have a wider molding or a molding with kind of a more decorative profile, it can be a little bit more difficult, but you just want it to be um, evenly 
positioned so that where the v-nail is going in, it's applying even pressure from the top. So I can tighten that down. And then I also want to set the depth. So when I push this all the way down, um, I want the handle to be just a little bit below horizontal. I'm then going to uh, apply the v-nails to this v-nail block. So this has uh, one permanent position and one sliding position. And if I'm going to use multiple V-nails, I can use both of these um, blocks here. I'm going to go with, we'll go with some 3 8 inch hard V-nails. So these just get installed in the V-nail block. There is a upward facing part. There's kind of, um, if you look very closely at the v-nails, there's almost like a blade on one side of them, and that's the side that goes up. So these just get positioned in the v-nail block, and then that goes underneath the whole apparatus. Make sure that's nice and tight. And now I can go ahead and gently pull this lever. All right, so there we have it. That is a one V-nail fastener in the back. This corner isn't quite perfect, but we can fix that later. So I'm gonna go ahead and join the second corner and then we can put the whole thing together. So I've got two of the frame corners joined. Now I'm gonna go ahead and finish with the last two corners. If I'm lucky, everything will stay mostly square, but I can also kind of stretch it and, and uh, torque it so that it fits nice and, nice and tight, keep those corners good. Now I can see that these aren't perfect joins. I know for certain that uh, with my miter saw, I'm getting a little bit of blade deflection, um, which will happen if you're not using a professional framing blade. Um, in this case, it's going to be totally fine because I can uh, fill the cracks and kind of hide those crimes later. But I will say in a professional frame shop, these corners would not be passable. Uh, this is just for, my, for myself, for home, so I'm not too worried about it. All right, let me give that a little spritz with some accelerator. Get a little drifting here. So those corners feel good enough. I'm gonna very carefully, because now I've got, oh, there we go. I've got the weight of the frame pulling in both directions. So I wanna make sure to do this really gently. And I might need a little bit more glue. Again, this works best if you're using the wood glue um, and a proper clamp setup. You would set it up overnight at least, let that glue cure fully, um, and then you're just attaching the fastener as kind of reinforcement at that point. Right now, I am sort of fudging this um, just to make it happen quickly. Uh, and the frame is pretty uh, small, it's pretty lightweight, so there's not going to be a lot of um, force pulling down on these corners. All right, so we have our completed frame, mostly completed, um, and I framed up this artwork. I matted this artwork. So this is just a, a poster, um, a risograph that I got uh, online, and I cut a custom mat for this. So I just bought a piece of mat board, and I have a special machine um, also made by that company called Logan that uh, has an angled blade that will cut this really nice sharp bevel that you see all the way around. So there's a little bit of measuring and fractions involved in figuring out exactly how to uh, get the sizes for this. Um, but basically it's, like I said, the, the artwork plus your uh, matte margin and you're calculating a little bit of extra of overlap because you want the edge of the mat to go over at the edge of your artwork. Now, matte board isn't strictly necessary. Um, you will hear a lot of uh, frame shops talk about the need for it. You don't typically want um, your glass or your plexiglass touching the surface of your artwork. Um, it's good to have just that tiny little bit of a, of a lift off of there. Um, especially if you have something like a photograph, the emulsion can stick to the glass with any type of humidity, so having the mat in there will um, protect your artwork. With framing, it's also really important to use um, archival like acid-free materials. Um, the non-acid-free stuff is definitely cheaper, but if you care about your artwork, um, if it's a document, something that's irreplaceable, it's definitely worth investing in the acid-free stuff. Um, typical papers have uh, binders that have acid and lignans in them that can 
um, over time will deteriorate your artwork. Uh, when working in the frame shop, we definitely saw lots of older, uh, you know, prints and things come in and you can actually see the border of where the non-acid free materials yellowed and deteriorated that over time. It can take 10 years or more for that to happen, but again, if it's you're taking the time to frame something um, and it's something that you care about, it's worth having the materials that aren't going to actually damage it um, over time. So. I cut a piece of archival mat for this, um, and I also cut a piece of plexiglass. Um, these are pretty inexpensive. You can get at a local plastic store. Um, frame shops will sometimes also cut these for you. Just cut a piece of glass or plexi um, so you can get that cut to your specific size. So in order to assemble this whole package, I'm going to create kind of, I call it the sandwich, um, which is your, your artwork your mat, your backing board, and also your plexiglass. So what I've done here is attach the artwork to a piece of archival foam board. I've got the mat board on top, and now I'm just gonna put this piece of plexi on top of the whole sandwich. Now, plexi and glass are gonna uh, pick up some static charge, especially as I peel back this plastic uh, protective film. It's gonna create lots of static on the surface and wanna pick up everything from your surrounding environment. So as much as possible, I'm trying not to get my fingers on top of this. All right, you can already see, I can see, there's all sorts of dust and hair and anything in this room that's wanting to stick to this. So the easiest way to clear off any of this debris um, is with a compressed, uh, you know, a compressed air gun. I wouldn't recommend using the desktop um, canned air anywhere near your artwork because uh, if you have it at an angle and it starts to um, get the condensation, you can actually damage your print. So if you're going to use the canned air, make sure you do this far away from your artwork. But I've actually got an air compressor here with an air gun. So. I'm gonna do the artwork first. All right, close enough and we'll see, we'll see if I missed anything. All right, now there's definitely some on the top. Another thing you want to be careful of um, if you're using glass is anything like Windex. Um, Windex is great for glass, but it is super not archival. So if you've gone to all the trouble to get acid-free materials and then you spritz it with Windex, you're just putting all those chemicals right back into that environment. So this looks pretty good. Um, you can get kind of as obsessive as you want to about catching all the dust. Just remember that once this is sealed, you're going to be looking at that forever. Um, I will show you a little trick. This is a framing secret. Um, if you have a stubborn piece of dust, instead of opening the whole thing back up and introducing more into the environment, you can use a little piece of tape with the sticky side up and just lift up the one area where you're seeing a piece of dirt. So like I've got a little piece in here, so I'm just gonna very carefully lift up that corner and slide the tape underneath until it sticks to that piece of dust and then I can pull it right out. All right, that looks good enough to me. So then I will put the frame, I like to put the frame over the top and slide the, the sandwich in from the back because then I know I'm not introducing anything new into that environment. So that's a nice snug fit. All right, now the next part, once this is in there, and you can double check, make sure that no, no dust, sometimes dust from the inside of the frame will sneak in there, but I think this looks pretty good. Okay, so I've got this in the frame. It's mostly dust-free. Uh, I always double check after I put the, the whole sandwich together because sometimes dust from the, the actual framing will get into the sandwich there. Um, but it looks, it looks pretty good. And the next step is to actually attach the artwork into the, the frame uh, border. 
So for that, I'm going to use a tool called a framing point gun. Uh, this is made by that same company, Logan, that makes uh, most of the framing stuff that I've got. Um, and this basically just drives a uh, flat uh, pointed little um, tab into the side of the frame. Uh, it's totally invisible from the outside, but it will hold this whole sandwich, kind of press it towards the front and keep everything nice and secure. So there's a couple different um, varieties of points. Uh, Really, there's just two kinds. There's um, rigid and flexible. The flexible ones are good if you ever think you might need to take the, the piece out, like say you have a diploma or something that you might want to put in a different frame or change out for something else. The flexible points um, will attach into the frame and you can always bend them back and out of the way. The rigid points are a little more permanent. Um, so I'm going to load some points into the gun, which just press that, and that opens up the cartridge here. There's actually already some points in there if you can see that. And then uh, basically this little ridge here, you just push that up against the back of the frame. And there you go. It's satisfying. All right, so that's the back. Now the artwork is nice and secure. That's not going to go anywhere. Just making sure that all that dust is still on the outside. It looks good. And we're ready to attach the final step, which is the backing. So on the back of the frame, you could leave this open, but we've gone to all the trouble to make everything nice and archival and sort of sealed from the environment. So the last step is to put a dust cover over the back of this and kind of fully close up that whole package. So for that, I'm just using uh, some brown paper, and you want to make sure this is archival as well. Put a frame on top of that. And I'm going to use some tape. This is, um, this is just a crafting variety, but typically you would use something called ATG tape, um, and it comes in a big gun like this, uh, advanced tape glider. Um, this is what they use in the frame shop and this stuff is also uh, acid-free adhesive. I've got the small version here and you basically just apply some glue. It's sort of um, a thin tape-like adhesive that will grab to the backing paper. And then just position that on there. All right. Then we can trim off the excess. There is another specialized tool for this called a dust cover trimmer that you can get. Um, it's basically just a a mount for a straight, a straight razor blade um, that will cut the edge nice and flush along the back. So there we go. Got a nice dust cover that looks super, super clean and professional on the back. So while we're back here, I'll show you how to attach some hanging hardware. Um, I will use uh, D-ring hangers, which are these little guys here. And these just uh, screw into the back of the frame molding and then you can string a wire across the back. So I like to measure a few inches from the top of the frame. Now, depending on the, the size of your frame, if you had a really big piece, you would want, uh, you know, you'd want a little bit more distance from the top. And my frame molding ends like here. So I'm gonna just drill a pilot hole. I've got a little tape flag on there to make sure that I don't go too deep into the frame.
And then some framing wire. I really like this um, coated wire. This is really easy on the fingers and the ends don't fray. I'll just give it a little bit of a tail there. Pull that nice and taut. Got our wire on there. One thing I like to do for myself for hanging is I'll pull this up to kind of as far as it goes and measure the distance to the top edge of the frame. So it looks like I've got about two and a half inches and then I will just rate two and a half at the top. That way I know when I go to hang this, I can make a mark where the top edge of the frame is and I know that I need my nail hole to go at that distance. Last thing are some rubber bumpers these little clear adhesive bumpers that go on the back bottom corners. And this just protects your wall and also makes sure that the um, frame doesn't shift at all once it's hanging. All right. So that's looking pretty good. There is one thing that I wanna fix. Now, as I mentioned before, my mitered corners are, well, they leave something to be desired, let's just say. White is probably the least forgiving, this flat white profile, um, because there's nothing to distract your eye from seeing these big gaps. Again, in a professional frame shop, these corners would probably be mostly invisible because you'd have a proper saw and a proper blade, um, but I can totally hide these crimes and make it work with what I have. There's another secret that I can show you, and this is sort of a, it's not that much of a secret in frame shops, but it's really useful. Um, it's a little sort of a paste wax that comes in a tin. Um, it's called Nail Hole and Corner Filler, and they come in a variety of different colors and finishes. And it's basically just a hard wax. This never really dries. And you can use this in the corners of your frame to kind of blend any of those seams and make them virtually invisible. So for this frame, I'm gonna go with a white finish, obviously, um, but there are other colors. So there's um, different metallics. I've got gold and silver here. They also have different um, wood grain uh, colors. So they've got like walnut and cherry, um, and you can mix them together. So if you've got a frame that's sort of a dark gold, like this one, for example, I've actually mixed black with the gold, um, and I just keep them in these uh, to-go sort of salad container cups. And then anytime I need that, uh, that finish, I've already got that pre-mixed. The reason I save this up for last is because if you apply this wax and any of it gets onto your work surface, any of those little waxy pieces, you can get it on your um, glass or even worse, you can get it on your artwork. So I wait until the frame is fully sealed up, everything's closed, and then I bring out the wax as the finishing step. So I'm gonna use a bigger popsicle stick here and you basically just scrape out a little bit and the same way you would apply like a wood filler or epoxy, you just sort of wipe it into that crevice. And you can already see how well it's disguising that seam. All right, so all the corners are kind of filled in with wax and I'm just gonna go ahead and wipe off all the excess. All right, there it is. So that is a finished picture frame. You almost can't tell that my corners were less than perfect, that, that uh, white putty really does some magic. And I have to say that's, that's the reason I haven't felt compelled to upgrade my saw because I can totally get away with it. But here is a, here's a pretty nice looking piece of art. It's all nice and finished in the back. And I'm very pleased with the finished product. I hope that this has given you some ideas for uh, tips for framing stuff at home. Um, you can check out links for a lot of these tools in the video description. Good luck with all your home framing projects and we'll see you next time. 
Thank you guys for watching that video. If you'd like to further support us at Tested, you can do so by buying some merch from us in our store. A link is below, but I wanted to tell you that for the first time, we are releasing a discounted bundle of Tested merch, specifically our original five demerit badges. These are ways in which every maker screws up. So we've got the measure once, curse twice, uh, releasing the mysterious blue smoke from electronics and stopping them from working, breaking a drill bit, uh, 3D printer going all flying spaghetti monster on you, and my personal most common one, cutting your finger. <laughs> yeah, get yourself over to tested-store.com and uh, line yourself up with some demerit badges. I'm gonna sew these to my apron. Oh, that actually would make a good one day build.